everybody's always talking about the threats to our democracy or even, you know, our republic. But what I want to ask today is who's the bigger threat to a republic, the people or the elites? Now, you may think that by asking that question, I'm just politically grandstanding, but I'm actually not really going to talk that much at all about our present situation, except by reference uh, as a way of comparison to what I'm really talking about today, and that's Republic Book 8. You guys, let's do it. Let's finish the Republic. We have been working through on this show book by book. It's been one of our big projects together. And it's been so much fun. Uh, you know, one of the things that I love about this show is that as you listen to more and more episodes, we kind of develop a shared vocabulary. And that is one of the things that a classical education is all about. You know, I always so say that this show is the classical education you didn't know you were being denied. And one of the things that, you know, our education system does is now that it's broken down so much and over many decades, there's been this attack on the idea of a common curriculum, the idea of a canon, right? Um, these things are supposedly discriminatory or they are, you know, they're racist, they have implicit biases and so on and so forth. But the, the grand irony, the kind of tragic irony of that is something that was pointed out actually by kind of a guy more on, on the liberal side of things, a guy named E.D. Hirsch, um, who made the argument for the canon specifically as a shared cultural language. Now, I don't think this is the only thing that's good about a classical education. I mean, at, at root, the great thing about the classical uh, wisdom that we talk about on this show is that it gives you the best that has been thought and said. That's what Matthew Arnold called it. Um, so it's, you know, the best thing is that it's true and that you can take it into your life and it can enrich your life and you can understand yourself and others better. Um, those are, I think, really the, the true benefits, the, the highest benefits of a classical education. But Hirsch pointed out that there is actually another benefit, and that is that the only way to have a shared community that isn't based just on how much money you have or what race you are or what religion you believe in, right? If you really believe in this kind of, you know, as it were, diverse, or you might say using a better term, pluralist republic, um, and if you really believe that people need to be able to move through social classes and, uh, and, you know, not just be stuck in the situation that they're born into, then you have to have a common store, a common treasure house of knowledge and wisdom and insight um, and, and books, things that people have read and talked about. Um, and once you gain a, a, a foothold in that, right, one of the reasons that they destroyed this in, in schools is because it actually creates real equality rather than the sort of race-based hierarchy that we're currently seeing our ruling class install. The, the true nature of American equality, right, which is that all men are created equal in the sight of God and therefore share, right, have a legitimate and God-given right to be free. Um, in order to make that real in society, one of the things you have to do is you have to have a, you know, a common idiom, a common, common language that isn't actually rooted in any particular time or place. And uh, Hirsch pointed out that, you know, you can you can grab these, uh, you know, th these canonical works as kind of a foothold into that and start to understand, you know, maybe you were born into a, a rich house, so you grew up surrounded by Shakespeare or whatever. But Hirsch's point was, well, but also, don't you want the kid that was born without any of that around? Maybe his parents were illiterate. Don't you want him to have kind of a way into that that shared community. And don't mistake me when I say that that is, you know, it's not bound to any particular time or place, right? Everything comes from a tradition. Everything has a history. But one of the things that we're engaged in in this country, right, is uh, giving people the opportunity to uh, not just be purely defined by their material circumstances in this kind of Marxist determinist way, right? It's just the class that you were born into. No, I mean, one of the ways that we open up the kind of rigid boundaries of social class in this country um, is we create a shared sense of, of ethos and a shared uh, cultural language. And the classical education is the system for delivering that to you so that, you know, you and I and basically anybody that has had that foothold in um, can be free to, you know, act and, and move from class to class and from, you know, social group to social group. And the, something binds us together. And one of the things that binds us together is our cultural inheritance. And so I say all of that as a long winded way of explaining why I love this aspect of 
the show because it is a classical education. It's uh, between me, the person, you know, doing the show, the host of the show, and you, the listeners, all of you guys out there. And I meet you and you're from all different walks of life. Some of you are farmers. Some of you are college professors. Some of you are, you know, writers and others are stay-at-home moms. And like, you know, you're this really beautifully diverse bunch in the true sense of, of the word. Um, and yet we have together built up a relationship over time and week by week. And part of that relationship. Uh, in fact, the core of that relationship is some of the stuff that, you know, I have loved and, and grown up with that gave me access into this uh, classical world is kind of my gradually sharing that with you and the stuff that you didn't know about, you now know about, and we have a kind of shared common language. And one of the ways that we've been doing that is like, oh, so we're talking about Machiavelli today, but remember how in Livy, like this stuff have, you know, once you start to get those footholds, they, they, they have a kind of exponential increase. Um, and so the Republic we decided was such an important book, uh, such a cornerstone of that architecture that we wanted to do an episode on every book. And we've been working our way up. We had a kind of big series on book seven a while back on the cave, because uh, I think that's one of the most important images of all time and also for our day. Um, and now I want to finish out this project. I'm really excited that we can actually conclude this because books eight, nine, and 10 are kind of a unit. Um, and so I'm going to start today with eight, and then we're going to push through uh, to the end of the Republic so we can say that we read the whole thing together. Let's get into it. When you are running a business, one thing you probably don't want to do is spend way too much time rifling through resumes. That's why you need Indeed when you are hiring. It's an important thing to do when you run a business, no question about it, to find good people. You really need the people around you that you enjoy working with, that are good at what they do, that you connect with, that work with the culture of your company. Um, and that's tough. That's like almost a full-time job if you're doing it all yourself, but you already have a full-time job, which is running your business. So you don't want to get caught up in this like endless hassle of hiring. Indeed is the hiring partner where you can attract, interview, and hire all in one place. It's super convenient. Instead of spending hours on multiple job sites to find candidates with the right skills, you need one powerful hiring partner that can help you to do it all. This is how Soundfront finds such good talent, which is awesome. Uh, and you can tell the work they do is phenomenal because you like this show. And you can start hiring yourself right now with a $75 sponsored job credit uh, when you go to indeed.com slash heretics. This is only for her young heretics listeners. You go to indeed.com slash heretics indeed.com slash heretics. Terms and conditions apply. Need to hire? You need Indeed. So the reason I say that books 8, 9, and 10 are kind of a unit is because we have sort of a structural break after the really, uh, you know, it's almost a climactic moment of the cave and the description of the philosopher ascending, right, to gaze with the eyes of the soul upon the idea of the good and then being forced back down to kind of come into re-enter the society of those who are trapped in the cave. Um, and it, Socrates has kind of rounded out that picture, which is really a metaphysical picture. It's kind of like a bedrock vision of how reality works. Um, but we got there in a kind of roundabout way. And so one of the things I wanted to do first here is just reca recap, because that's what they do. The uh, interlocutors at the beginning of book eight of the Republic, they sort of do a little recap of how do we how did we get here and how do we get off off course? Um, so just to recap, right, we've kind of so far we've had, uh, you know, a, a few different sections of the Republic. And I, I would suggest that, you know, as you start to look back on this whole book that we've read together, you can think of it as basically divided into three different sections with a little prelude at the beginning. And the prelude is that book one, that's where, you know, uh, Socrates went down to the Piraeus and he gets stopped by the household and, and family of Cephalus and some of his friends, right? And they kind of uh, waylay him and he has to go and have this conversation and they end up in this fight with Thrasymachus. Thrasymachus, the sophist, over what is justice. Um, and Thrasymachus has this, uh, as we've discovered, this sort of popular or at least fashionable idea that justice is just the will of the stronger. All of this other stuff is window dressing. It's all fantasy. It's all nice, happy talk that, yes, there's you know such thing as the good and whatever. But really, it's just that people get power and they win and you lose. And justice is just the word that we use to describe that. Dynamic. And Socrates kind of picks this apart. He says, well, is it what's really good for the rulers or just what they think is good? Because if if it's what's really good, then isn't there a good that's independent of, you know, so, so you can go back to those episodes and, and start to uh, and, and remember how that works. 
worked right. But that kind of sets us off on this new journey um, because we've kind of cleared the sophist relativism out of the way. And then we start to say with Glaucon and Adamantus, who remember Plato's brothers, sons of Ariston, they start to say, well, okay, so you've, you've told us what justice is not. You've refuted one of the great errors of our day, but that doesn't tell us what justice is. So let's really actually be serious about it and take it as a positive project to describe what justice is. And so that is what embarks us upon really step you know, part one proper. Cephalus goes to bed. Thersimachus has been basically dismissed as uh, as a relevant character, right? Um, and we are now embarking upon uh, what Socrates ends up turning into a kind of civilization, imaginary civilization building project, because uh, he decides that what we want to do is treat the city as a kind of soul, a human soul in macrocosm or other way around. You say, well, cities are just made up of people and people have these little, these structures within them, which are then built up into cities. And so if we look at a city and we ask what justice is in a city, um, then we can find out what justice is in the human soul. And this is all to kind of answer the question, is it, you know, good in itself to be just, or are we only just for other, the purposes of other benefits? And, you know, in order to answer that question, Socrates develops out this famous definition of justice, that it is sum cuique, that it has to do with uh, giving to each what he or she or it is due, right? Everything in its rightful place. And that takes place in the soul, right? The right arrangement of your reason, your courage, and your desires, which are the three parts in, in Plato of the soul. Um, that, so that's justice within the human person. And then justice within the city is the arrangement of classes to do what they're best suited to doing. So you have a class of kind of philosopher kings, right? Um, you have these sort of auxiliary uh, military guardians, and then you have like uh, the productive classes, and they are analogized to the parts of the soul, and they each kind of have are in their place. We talked about some of the uh, difficulties of this, whether it's meant to be serious or not. Um, but as an answer to the question, right, is it good to be just, it's actually very powerful, because it shows you that justice, right, it being a virtue and being in some sense, one of the highest virtues of the human soul, justice is it is its own reward, right, that it has uh, it, it's just akin to a kind of spiritual health. Um, and, and that has all these implications. So that's sort of part one. Um, part two, which we've just kind of finished, is really kicked off by an interruption on the part of Adamantus, because Glaucon, who is sort of the, you know, the uh, lusty, ambitious young man uh, that really drives most of the conversation, is, is he's the main guy that's going back and forth with Socrates a lot of the time. But Adamantus, his brother, does break in. And one of the points at which he breaks in is to say, well, uh, it's all very well and good to talk about how great philosophy is and how truth should be our guiding light and how justice is a, an absolute and not a kind of relative term. Um, but actually, like, you know, when you look at real life philosophers, they're either very corrupt, like the Thrasymachuses of the world, or they're kind of annoying and irrelevant, like they're eggheads in an academy. And he's really invoking Aristophanes' clouds here, which we've also talked about, this notion, this accusation that was levied at Socrates, that really you're kind of abstracting away from what's truly useful to the state. Um, and Socrates' initial answer to that is, well, that's because your idea of useful is itself corrupt, that you have a, a false or a, a cynical idea of the good that's been installed exactly by these sort of fake philosophers. So that gets us into this whole thing about what is the nature of true philosophy, true knowledge, true reality, uh, which is why we embark upon the journey of the cave, right? So that's part two. We've just kind of finished part two. We've gone into it at a great length. You can go back and look at those episodes to, to figure out, you know, what we said about that. Um, but this is by way of summation, because now we're getting back to politics. And by way of this detour that has kind of opened up our eyes into the, like you might say, maybe, maybe call it like, you know, lifting up the hood on reality, this kind of idea that actually underneath all of our disciplines, politics, philosophy, astronomy, right? Um, there is a kind of bedrock reality of the world of the unchanging forms, uh, which is never fully instantiated, never fully made physically real in this world. It's never perfect. And yet everything we do is determined by and judged against those absolute standards, right? Um, and so once we've established that, uh, we have this notion still laying around, right, that the guy who finally attains a kind of nirvana, he wouldn't have put it this way, but the guy who kind of sees the idea of the good is then going to have to be forced to come back down and govern um, because we need these people to bring their 
abstract and arcane knowledge to bear upon the messy day to day of politics. And so uh, it, broadly speaking, books eight and nine, which kind of are a pair, are going to bring us back to the concrete realm of politics. And 10 is going to uh, sort of cap it all off while also looking out into the kind of the, uh, the heavens again. Um, and so the, that's the structure of the book overall. And we're now in a position to sort of look at that and understand that that's how it's working. Um, and we haven't really done that yet, you know, because we've been going book by book. And so we've been saying, well, this is what this book is about. And this is why this conversation leads to that. But it's really artful how Plato eventually like pulls back the curtain and reveals that, you know, this is this whole thing has been also masterfully orchestrated by himself, by a kind of author architect. Um, and now we have a sense of, you know, where we need to go next. And it turns out that the next thing we need to talk about um, is the different Part kinds of regimes, because we've been building the perfect regime, the Calipolis, right, which is a republic um, in the sense of being a politeia. Um, and the politeia is like the kind of ideal constitution, right, the ideal way of organizing life together. And uh, it turns out that it is tripartite. And this is going to be a feature of republics forever. It balances the three kind of basic parts of society, the basic parts of humanity against one another. Um, but it turns out that not every regime is like that. Not every city does organize itself that way. In fact, most cities don't. It, you might even say all cities are not the Calipolis. You know, some cities since uh, Plato and even, you know, while Plato was writing, you know, have tried this tripartite regime, but even they, right, don't get it perfect. Um, and so what we're about to embark upon is kind of the cycle of regimes taken from the other end uh, that we usually take it from. So usually when I talk about the cycle of regimes, um, I talk about it a lot in terms of our present moment. We've just talked about Caesar, right, and Washington and our uh, current Supreme Court and how, the, you know, re how republics uh, kind of are designed to stave off regime decay. Um, and this is because, you know, from ancient political philosophy, we get this idea of it's called anacyclosis, that there are three basic types of regime. Uh, you can have rule by the people, you can have rule by a few, or you can have rule by one. Um, and each of those has kind of a good and bad version. And the good version decays into the bad version. And then another regime takes over. So you get the king becomes, you know, the king's son becomes a tyrant and the nobles rise up. So then you get aristocrats, but those guys kind of become corrupt or their, their, uh, you know, successors start to just, uh, rule for the benefit of their own cronies. And so then the people rise up, uh, but the people are kind of subject to mob forces and they, uh, end up dissolving into chaos and into the chaos, their strides, a strong man. We've talked about this before on the show many times. Polybius, uh, deals with it in detail. Some of it comes from Aristotle. There's there's elements of Herodotus and Aeschylus in it. Um, but we haven't really talked about Plato's contribution to this whole dialogue. Um, and that is kind of to look at the thing from the other way around. He says, well, okay, so you have the cycle of regimes, the way to arrest it. Um, he wouldn't have put it quite this way, but like, you know, the Republic uh, or the, the tripartite regime sort of balances these three different kinds of rule against one another, or at least these three different sorts of forces uh, are sort of held in tension. Um, but also uh, that too can break down. It has its own kind of decay. It's much more resistant to decay, um, but it can break down. And eventually then you get back to the cycle of regime. So this is something that's very much on our minds, right? Because we ostensibly have a Republic. That's what our constitution gives us, uh, guarantees to us, in fact, as a form of a Republican form of government. And there are three sections of it, right? There's the kind of quasi monarchic presidency. There's the democracy element where people vote, right? The people get an input, a crucial, right? Popular sovereignty in the good sense, which means that sovereignty rests with the people and then is distributed by them in the social contract to other people. Um, and, and they distribute it to the legislators, right? Who are sort of an elite, right? Along with the justices, they are sort of it. And so, you both have a tripartite system of government with the courts, the legislature and the executive, and you have sort of a tripartite um, structure of your broader political society in the three different social classes. Um, and that's kind of where we're at, except that we also note that we are sort of subject to this oligarchic capture, that there are actually an increasingly small number of people who have like all the money, all the power over the tech, um, who are just, uh, you know, we're constantly electing the same politicians over and over again. They're all like 80 gajillion years old. And, um, and so Plato is looking at an issue that is very much of concern to us. And he's looking at it as a way of saying, well, what are the kind of the other options and how, uh, you know, is, is this Republic really the best regime? So let me read to you now from the kind of plan for book eight, uh, so that we can embark 
upon this, uh, you know, I, I think one of the more insightful descriptions of what will eventually become known as, you know, Republican regime capture by way of uh, oligarchic decay. So I'm reading always from Alan Bloom's translation of the Republic. It's got essays and notes in it that are uh, by and large extremely helpful, like the translation very much. Um, always, of course, recommend uh, reading in the original, but uh, translations very obviously necessary. Nobody can read every language. And this is a this is a good one. So if you're interested in getting one and you haven't yet, check out Alan Bloom's Republic. Here is uh, the interchange right between Glaucon and Socrates that sort of leads us into this discussion. He says, uh, Glaucon says, I myself really desire to hear what four regimes you were talking about. So he says, there's four regimes. There's the one we've been talking about. And then there's basically three others. And he's like, what are the other ones? Um, and Socrates says, well, it won't be hard for you to hear. For those I mean are also the ones having names, the one that is praised by the many, that Cretan and Laconian regime, and second in place and second in praise, the one called oligarchy, a regime filled with throngs of evils, and this regime's adversary, arising next in order, democracy, and then the noble tyranny at last, excelling all of these, the fourth and extreme illness of a city, or have you some other idea of a regime that fits into some distinct form? For dynasties and purchased kingships and certain regimes of the sort are somewhere between these, and one would find them no less among the barbarians than among the Greeks. So notice there's something a little bit different here. Uh, the Aristotelian idea, which is going to come later about regime decay, that then leads into Polybius and Anacyclosis, right? That is not quite what Plato is saying. It's something a little bit different, which is he's basically saying, this is the perfect ideal. The republic that I've established, not, you know, our specific republic, but this sort of tripartite regime, the perfect Calypolis, um, that's perfect. And everything else just re represents successive degrees of decay away from that. And so he's looking basically at the bad and evil uh, elements or nature of these of, of these alternative regimes, in part as an advertisement for the one that he's just built, right? So do you know, I said, that it is necessary that there also be as many forms of human characters as there are forms of regimes? Or do you suppose that the regimes arise from an oak or rocks and not from the dispositions of men in the cities, which tipping the scale, as it were, draw the rest along with them? Now, that's uh, arising from oak or rock. This is like an epic stock phrase. And there's actually a lot of quotes from uh, epic poetry in here and other Greek poetry, um, Greek verse in this work, which is sort of interesting in and of itself. But this uh, rising out of rock, uh, uh, being uh, autochthonous is the word that is sometimes thrown around. It means you come automatically out of the chthon, out of the earth. Um, uh, this idea is like it just comes out of nowhere. He says, no, that's not actually how politics works. Politics is a matter of psychology writ large, right? Um, psychology, the study of the psyche, of the soul. Um, and, and the soul, which is just the whole inner life, the whole essential nature of the person, right? The character of the man. Uh, eventually, you add up enough of those uh, important people in a regime and you get the character of the state. So just as we were looking at justice in a soul and justice in a big city, we're also going to be looking at all the different kinds of people, uh, the, the, the kind of soul that makes up these other forms of regimes. And so let's get into what those four forms are here. You know what's fun? Canceling subscriptions you don't want. And you know who will help you? true bill. I actually get a certain pleasure when somebody has scammed me into or roped me into a subscription. You know, it's like, oh, I needed to read this one article and now I'm paying through the nose for like the New York Times because I totally forgot that I started paying them or whatever. Like it gives me a certain perverse pleasure to just be like, cancel, you're axed. But you forget about these things and you don't, you know, you don't cancel them. And so then you end up bleeding money that you could be using for other more important stuff, certainly not for the New York Times. I mean, come on. So what Truebill does is it scans through your subscriptions um, and it finds the ones that you're not using so that you can just cancel. It makes it super, super easy and it can save you a lot of money. There's one guy, Matthew B., who says that in a matter of seconds, I saved $660 for the year on my DirecTV bill, $120 for the year on my SiriusXM bill, $840 a year on my car insurance. That is a ton of cash and you can use it for all sorts of more useful things than to be paying for subscriptions you don't need. So don't fall for that. Start canceling today at truebill.com slash heretics. Use that link just for my listeners, truebill.com slash heretics. It could save you thousands a year. So 
we, Socrates listed the three other forms, right? And the first one is the one that is going to take us a second to get into. So let me leave that aside for a bit. The second two you'll have heard of, oligarchy and tyranny. And he's basically saying that oligarchy leads way to tyranny. And remember that this is not anacyclosis. This is the decay, how, how a republic breaks down into its constituent parts, essentially. Um, and so the first thing it breaks down into or turns into um, is what he calls the Laconian and the Cretan regime. Uh, he's referring to the, you know, the way that Sparta is run, at least in his own estimation, um, that it's not actually a true republic exactly so much as a timocracy. Um, time, right, is the Greek word for honor. And so any Greek inflected word that has tim in it, it usually has something to do with honor. Um, and so basically, he's talking about the way that love of the good in itself, which is what the the philosopher kings are supposed to be led to, right? Love of the good decays into love of seeming good, love of honor, right? Love of being recognized for being good. Um, and of course, that is a very, very easy slip to make. And we all make it in some sense, right? There's no such thing as a pure human soul here on this earth. Um, and we all, right, uh, start out loving a thing, let's say you're really passionate about writing, and then you're, or you're really passionate about like music and you just love it and you get so good at it. And then people, you know, suddenly they start paying you for it. They start applauding you. And now it's like, well, I'll do the music that will make you pay me. But that means that the payment, right. And the, the honors and the recognition and the fame, right. That's suddenly your highest good, not the music itself. So you might call this like selling out or something. Right. Um, but this is the kind of way, uh, Plato says that this, this breakdown occurs. And he says it comes about through a form of sort of like succession problems that always, you know, eventually you're going to get a new crop of guardians uh, that's sort of subpar. It's not quite as good as the others. And this puts some of his eugenics stuff into another light here that he he's concerned about generational uh, continuity, right? Um, he's obviously also been saying all sorts of nasty stuff about like leaving babies to die. So we don't really, like let him off the hook for that or anything. Um, but one of the reasons why he's so concerned with like, you know, having the right people be born at the right time is because he recognizes that in order to, uh, you know, ensure continuity in this form of state, you have to have people that like can train up the next generation or give birth to the next generation. Um, and so he goes into all of this kind of Pythagorean numerology about when's the right time to have a baby. And, uh, you know, you can, you can check this out if you want. I'm not going to go into it in too much detail. There was still a lot of this uh, around in Plato's day and Plato was very uh, taken with it. Some of it quite kooky, some of it actually suggestive of reality. Um, this is all like a way of saying though, that eventually you're going to get a generation of guardians that uh, just aren't quite up to snuff. And so let me now read to you uh, sort of what happens as that uh, comes to pass. So remember that we've we've defined these classes in terms of bronze, iron, uh, silver, and gold, right? That these different kind of uh, it's a it's a noble myth, he calls it. Uh, we might not call it so noble, but it's the lie that there is like a kind of distinction between human souls that goes down to this level of like, you know, you're some are golden. So he's saying the, the mixing of iron with silver and of bronze with gold engenders unlikeness and inharmonious irregularity, which once they arise, always breed war and hatred in the place where they happen to arise. Faction must always be said to be of this ancestry whenever it happens to arise. And we'll say, he said, that what the muses answer is right. Necessarily, I said, for they are they are muses. This is sort of a part of a conversation about Hesiod, because in Hesiod, you have the gradual decay of the of the different ages of man, right? Um, that first you have the kind of golden age and then gradually, this is where we get our idea of a golden age, right? Um, and so as he's sort of comparing it to this, he says, once faction has arisen, each of these two races, the iron and the bronze, pulled, or had arisen rather, uh, pulled the regime toward money making and the possession of land, houses, gold and silver, while the other two, the gold and silver, not being poor but rich by nature, led the souls toward virtue and the ancient establishment. Struggling and straining against one another, they came to an agreement on a middle way. They distributed lands and houses to be held privately, while those who previously were guarded by them as free and friends and supporters they then enslaved and held as serfs and domestics, and they occupied themselves with war and in guarding against these men. In my opinion, he said, this is the source of this transformation. Wouldn't this regime, I said, be a certain middle between aristocracy and ol oligarchy? Most certainly. This will be the way of the transformation. But once transformed, how will it be governed? Or is it evident that in some things it will imitate the preceding regime and in others oligarchy because it is a middle and that it will also have something peculiar to itself? And so this is 
the transitional phase, right, on its way to oligarchy. Um, and it has to do with faction. And we've talked about this before, wealth inequality, right? It has to do, and this is why I began by saying, are the elites or the people more uh, are more dangerous to a republic? And, and Plato is basically, um, again, in some, like with some things that we would not want to endorse, like this kind of strict separation between the different like genetic classes, he's nevertheless identifying something very real, which is that, you know, what you pass on from generation to generation matters. Why do you think that we're having such big fights right now over the schools, right? The public schools, what are we going to teach our kids, right? Well, it's because this, the whole health of a society depends on the, what we here on this show, you and I are doing right now, which is kind of gathering up the the best stuff from the past and bringing it uh, into the next generation and, you know, making modifications where necessary, but basically establishing that line of continuity. Um, and so Plato is saying, uh, sort of riffing on the Hesiod idea. This is from Works and Days, by the way, Hesiod's Works and Days. Hesiod, uh, the other kind of epic poet from this archaic period besides Homer, most uh, scholars place him uh, later in time than Homer, although only a little bit. Um, and he has these two major poems, the Theogony and the Works and Days that survive. Um, and the Works and Days is kind of about um, it's eventually going to be about, you know, agriculture and industry, but it begins uh, with this account of the world um, as kind of gradually decaying from different metals, right? And so the Socrates uh, in, in Plato is obviously very influenced by this, and he kind of riffs on it, and he says, well, you know, once you start to create these factions within the state that are based on wealth and property, um, you're going to get you know, a kind of a dragging down effect. Um, and eventually you're going to get the two cities, which we've talked about before, this this competition between the haves who are trying to protect their power and the have nots. Um, and, and this is why, again, I began by asking this question, which is actually a question from Machiavelli. Um, so let's take a brief detour here to talk about Machiavelli's uh, account of this, because it might not be what you expect if you have only heard of Machiavelli, like, you know, as the you know, evil ruthless guy who thinks that princes should be ruthless. Um, but uh, Machiavelli has a, a book, The Discourses on Livy, which we've touched on a little bit on this on this show, uh, in which, you know, during his exile, he spent all of this time um, in the early 16th century reading the classics, which were coming back suddenly into favor, being rediscovered, retranslated in Europe at that point. And this was his consolation in exile as he had been shunted out of political life. He said, I, I feed on the food which only is mine. That He has this special and unique relationship with guys like Cicero and Livy. And um, one of the things that that comes out of this period eventually is the discourses on Livy, which is a sort of assessment of you know, what can be learned from uh, Livy's books one through 10, the kind of early history of Rome. Um, and in it, there is some of the most sophisticated uh, discussion, bar none, of the relationship between social classes and class. And that's what Plato is talking about here too. He's talking about the kind of breakdown of harmony between the haves and the have-nots. Um, the haves no longer distributing of their wealth or using their wealth for the good but simply for themselves, right, um, which is eventually going to become full-on oligarchy. Um, and, and here's what Machiavelli writes in chapter five of, of book one of the Discourses on Livy. He says it's, it's called whether the guardianship of public freedom is safer in the hands of the commons or of the nobles, and whether those who seek to acquire power or they who seek to maintain it are the greater cause of commotions. And I want to note something interesting here, which is you can find this text in a number of places, but one of the places you can find it is uh, at Marxists.org, a kind of vast Marxist reference library, um, which tells you something, right, about the nature of Machiavelli's commentary. Now, obviously, I'm no big fan of Marxism, and I think that, you know, if you if you were to perform a Marxist reading of this text, you would end up with all sorts of distortions that uh, I think overplay what Machiavelli is saying, because it turns out he's actually very measured about the balance between elites and and the people, right? He's not just saying, oh, the the great uh, proletariat must rise up and overthrow their oppressors or whatever. Um, nevertheless, right, it's kind of an interesting factoid that this is a, a work which sort of defies some of our political categories. And part of the realignment that we're seeing in American politics right now, uh, which is, as I've said before, all about social class, right? And uh, not just social class, but, you know, kind of class hierarchy in general, who has the money, who has the power, who has the cultural weight, right? Um, and, and it's, you know, it's even, it goes so much deeper than just like, you know, there are some 
conservative gajillionaires, of course, right? Um, but there are also these centers, these institutional centers of power, like Silicon Valley, like the Academy, um, where, as I was just hearing from my friend Amy Wax at UPenn, right, they're trying basically to remove even tenure for conservatives, right, for people that don't have the same uh, opinions as the correct ones, right? Um, and, and so this oligarchy, this hardening oligarchy, which has control over many important credentialing institutions, right, um, this is, in fact, a, uh, a, a, a natural feature, right, of, of societies uh, that break down, right? When societies break down, you get this sense that, like, you know, well, we're actually enemies. We're actually two cities within one another. Um, and, you know, you get all these different scripts of the blue team, the red team, the um, the hobbits and the elves, as Curtis Yarvin recently put it, right? Uh, and and these uh, this is back to Plato's sense, right, that the true death of a republic um, is that loss of a sense that you're all one people, right? And you have different roles maybe and different uh, amounts of property and all of these things, but they fundamentally believe in the justice of how those things were arrived at. And one of the things that's been so painful for the right recently is sort of starting to lose faith in that meritocratic ideal, which did obtain for so many of us in the past in our youth, right? That now we actually don't feel like the people who have the most prestige, like, you know, say Nicole Hannah Jones winning a Pulitzer, right? The people who have the most prestige are not actually coming by it in an honest way. They're coming by it in uh, an incredibly dishonest and corrupt way. Um, so let me now, with that in mind, right, with the sense that this is what we're facing, what Plato's talking about, and what Machiavelli is considering, let me read some of his very measured reflections on the elites and the nobles. He says, of the provisions made by wise founders of republics, one of the most necessary is for the creation of a guardianship of liberty. For according as this is placed in good or bad hands, the freedom of the state will be more or less lasting. Remember that Machiavelli, unlike, you know, this sort of tripartite account, basically says now in the new world, there's only republics and principates. There's, there's republics, there's ruled by one, and then there's this republican form. Um, and in some sense, you know, Plato would agree with him because he's going to say that everything decays toward tyranny unless you have this sort of safeguard guardianship of liberty. And so the question arises, Machiavelli goes on, to which of these two this guardianship can most safely be entrusted to the nobles or to the commons? Uh, among the Lacedaemonians of old, as now with the Venetians, it was placed in the hands of the nobles. But with the Romans, it was vested in the commons. And this is one of the reasons, you know, uh, Machiavelli is sort of adumbrating one of the reasons why Sparta for Plato is a timocracy. It's people who seek honors, right? Who seek to be as noble as possible um, rather than who seek the good, right? We have therefore to determine which of these states made the wider choice. If we look to reasons, something is to be said on both sides of the question. Though, were we to look to results, we would have to pronounce in favor of the nobles in as much as the liberty of Sparta and Venice has a, had a longer life than that of Rome. So he's saying, well, if you're if you're just making a utilitarian argument, um, then you you, uh, you know cities with a kind of democratic structure have a better track record. Um, but if we look to a uh, philosophical argument about what's good and right, there are other questions, right? As touching reasons, that's what he means by reasons, right? What's actually good um, in the abstract? He says it may be pleaded for the Roman method that they are most fit to have charge of a thing who least desire to pervert it to their own ends. And doubtless, if we examine the aims which the nobles and the commons respectively set before them, we shall find in the former a great desire to dominate, in the latter merely a desire not to be dominated over, and hence a greater attachment to freedom, since they have less to gain than the others by destroying it. Wherefore, when the commons are put forward as the defenders of liberty, they may be expected to take better care of it, as they have no desire to tamper with it themselves, to be less apt to suffer others to do so. Now, this is something that uh, is perhaps not often enough discussed uh, in our political struggles, which is that there is an inherent imbalance between those who want to rule you, right, who want to tell you where to go uh, and how to deal with COVID, right, whether you can leave your house or not, who want to uh, dictate what you can and can't say to one another on social media, who you can hire, who you can't, who you can fire and how and when, right? The people who want to rule you and the people who just want to be left alone. Um, and Machiavelli is very frank about this. Um, and the, it, it goes both ways because on the one hand, that makes the people generally more inclined to when they get power, just to use it to sort of say, well, just don't just leave us alone because they know what it's like to be beaten down. Right. On the other hand, um, the people who want to rule you are often much more energetic and forceful about that because it's a positive goal rather than the negative goal of just being left alone. So, so Machiavelli says, on the other hand, he who defends the method followed by the Spartans and Venetians may urge that by confiding this guardianship to the nobles, two desirable ends are served. First, that from being allowed to retain in their own hands a weapon which makes them the stronger party in the state, 
the ambition of this class is more fully satisfied. Uh, and second, that the an authority is withdrawn from the unstable multitude, which, as used by them, is likely to lead to endless disputes and tumults, and to drive the nobles into dangerous and desperate courses, in instance whereof might be cited the case of Rome itself, wherein the tribunes of the people, being vested with this authority, not content to have one consul or plebeian, insisted on having both, and afterwards laid claim to the censorship, the praetorship, and all the other magistracies in the city. Nor was this enough for them, but carried away by the same fractious spirit, they began after a time to pay court to such men as they thought able to attack the nobility, and so gave occasion to the rise of Marius and the overthrow of Rome. Now, so this goes on for, for quite a bit with sort of granular details about some of the stuff that we were just talking about, right? The downfall of the Roman, the Roman Republic and the decay of the state. Um, but note that he's weighing carefully these two. Each of these classes has its own blind spots, its own difficulties. And you have to pay attention, as we've discussed before, to satisfying the ambitions of the excellent, right? People that want to be, you know, uh, the best and the, the brightest in the world, right, um, have to have ways that they can do that in a way that benefits the state. And this is one of the things I often say, like, we're not anti-elites, right, in the, in, you know, those, those of us who sort of sympathize with populism or who have a kind of populist streak, right, um, it, it, the idea is not to, like, get rid of elites. The idea is we need better elites who actually have the interests of the people at heart, right? Um, um, and so, you know, Machiavelli is saying, well, that can break down. But on the other hand, the people, when they do rise up, can uh, become so hungry. Suddenly they have a taste of power, right, that they want to basically like overrun, overrun the entire state. Nevertheless, and this is the conclusion, he says, I believe that as a rule, disorders are more commonly occasioned by those seeking to preserve power because in them the fear of loss breeds the same passions as are felt by those seeking to acquire, since men never think they hold what they have securely, unless when they are gaining something new from others. It is also to be said that their position enables them to operate uh, changes with less effort and greater efficacy. Further, it may be added that their corrupt and insolent behavior inflames the minds of those who have nothing with the desire to have, either for the sake of punishing their adversaries by despoiling them or to obtain for themselves a share of those riches and honors which they see the others abuse. Okay, so this is uh, one of the most important passages, I think, in, in the discourses on Livy. It's a really beautiful conclusion to this discussion, and it tells you a lot of what you need to know about our present state and about what Plato is talking about in book eight, right? That um, when you have a group of people, right, who feel anxious about can re retaining their power because they feel a sense of guilt that they're using it wrongly. Those are the most dangerous people, right? Um, because not only are they, uh, do they then act out, right, and punish and uh, pursue those who pose a threat to them, um, but they also, right, betray the trust of the state and of the institutions because they were supposed to be the best, right? They were supposed to be the good ones. Um, and so their corrupt and insolent behavior inflames the mind of those who have nothing. Um, and so, in, you know, if we're going to place blame one direction or another, right, it has to be on the people to whom, who are supposed to be held to higher standards, right? That's why I get so down on our elites all the time. It's like, you guys, you COVID uh, authorities, the CDC, like the people in political power, the people with, you know, control of our technologies, like these guys are supposed to be, they're representing themselves, right, as the good guys. They're, we're the ones you can trust. And so when you betray that trust, you don't just betray trust in, you know, Anthony Fauci or trust in, Elon Musk or whoever, right? You betray trust in the notion, the very notion of a kind of uh, beneficial and non-arbitrary political power and authority, right? That now the CDC itself is compromised. The WHO, uh, the presidency, right? These, these institutions, uh, uh, academia is also one of them, right? Even extra political bodies, right? Now those very institutions are compromised because the people that they have elevated, right, have betrayed our trust. And this is part of what makes the, uh, the, the, sort of conflicts on the right so painful right now is that conservatives want to believe in their country and in their institutions. Um, and to lose that faith, to see it betrayed, right, um, is, is an incredible slap in the face. And this is a big uh, source of many of our current partisan tensions. Um, so let's get back to Plato, uh, because Plato now, right, has sort of led us up to this. But remember, he was talking both about regimes and people. Um, so let's talk now about how the democratic man comes into being, right? How it is that, uh, you know, the, the kind of person, the elite who will lead uh, ends up becoming not an aristocrat, not, not the best, uh, but rather a timocrat, somebody that only wants honors. I was doing goblet squats. <laughs> People know what that is. It's like squats, but with a dumbbell and you hold it uh, in, in the center. And I really kind of felt like a twinge in my back. So I got home and I used my 
Theragun. And I have to tell you, it worked so well. I mean, I generally sort of use Theragun regularly because you hold all sorts of tension in your back and you just don't even know, or your shoulders, especially if you're writing or working all day um, or just walking around, you just get tension. Plus, then you add exercise on top of that. Um, you really do need something to release it. And Theragun is the handheld percussive therapy device that releases your deepest muscle tension using a scientifically calibrated combo of depth, speed, and power. Plus, it's super quiet, holds well, stores well, charges well, whether you want to treat your muscle tension from working out an injury or just the stresses of everyday life, there is no substitute for the Theragun. Gen 4, and you can get it for 30 days starting at only $199 when you go to therabody.com slash heretics right now to get your Gen 4 Theragun. It's therabody.com slash heretics, therabody.com slash heretics for 30 days trial starting at only $199. So remember, right, that Plato's psychology, which has also come into being throughout the course of this uh, long discussion in the Republic. Um, one of the brilliant things about it is that it is both an elevated sort of metaphysics and a very real uh, observation of how people behave. And the, the golden thread that links it all is the idea, which will become the sort of Aristotelian idea eventually, of telos, right, of the goal, of the good. Um, and he says, you know, this is one of the great insights of pagan philosophy, right? People do things because they want things, and wanting something means you think that it's good, right? It's not that you don't think other things are also good, or that, you, you know, you might think you have to do a bad thing, you have to kill somebody to get the crown, right? But you do that because you think the crown is better than the life of the person. And so, uh, even moral virtues and vices are understood in terms of correct and incorrect assessments of what is good. Um, and so this becomes a kind of erotic account and not erotic in the sense of, uh, you know, physical lust, uh, although that is part of it, but eros in the higher sense of, of that passionate desire for the thing that is good, right? For the thing that you hold to be best. Um, and so that sort of uh, morality and metaphysics of, of, you know, all things trending toward that what they identify as, as a purpose or as a highest good, right, then translates into a politics and a psychology because the psychology is, well, who are you if not defined by what you hold as your highest good? And what is in you personally might ask yourself this question, what do I say is my highest good? And what do my actions imply about you know, how, how my uh, values actually play out, right? Um, if I say that, you know, I, I want to honor God and my marriage, um, but I repeatedly step out on my wife, right? I repeatedly cheat on my spouse, um, then, you know, there's some part of me somewhere that doesn't hold fidelity uh, and marriage as a highest good in that context, but actually, you know, has some other desire. Now, you may say, okay, I don't actually think that the sex that I'm having with my mistress is the highest good. Um, and that's true of your logos, of your reason, right? Your re you never with your reason say that that's true. Um, and yet your, your passions, your physical desires, right? are structured in such a way as to point toward the sex in uh, as a highest good. And that's what, you know, your your uh, sort of appetites, your uh, your yeah, your appetitive soul points toward. Um, and so one of the things you're doing is you're letting the appetitive soul rule. Right. And I'm getting a little bit ahead of myself because that's, you know, the concept of rulership is the concept of not only right. What is the highest good for each part of your soul, but what uh, part of your soul is getting to have the last word in the case of a conflict, right? Um, and Plato's argument is basically going to be that like your your brain, your logos, your mind, I should say, not your brain, but your mind um, has a sense of the good, which incorporates all the other goods. Um, and if you let your, your mind guide you to the pure and the true and the good, you're going to get all the other goods wrapped up. Um, but if you let other parts of your soul rule you, then your, uh, your highest good will be something lower than is possible uh, to be. So here's, you know, the first, uh, this, this, is, uh, this book sort of outlines a series of corruptions that might take place in the soul, right? The love of different things that are lower than the good, right? Uh, and the first one is honor. And so here's how this, this man is, what this man is like. Uh, he says he's more stubborn and somewhat less apt at music, although he loves it. And music is interesting because like they're about to have a big uh, fight with the poets, but they're still, you know, music as a kind of 
pure art, right? Is something that expresses the harmony of a person's soul, right? He'll be loved after music, though he loves it, and must be a lover of hearing, although he's by no means skilled in rhetoric. With slaves, such a, a man would be brutal, not merely despising slaves as the adequately educated man does, but with free men, he would be tame, and to rulers most obedient. He is a lover of ruling and of honor, not basing his claim to rule on speaking or anything of the sort, but on warlike deeds and everything connected with war. He is a lover of gymnastic and the hunt. Yes, he said, we're, we're having now a conversation with Adamantus. That is, that is the disposition belonging to this regime. Wouldn't such a man, I said, when he is young and also, also despise money, but as he grows older, take ever more delight in participating in money, uh, but at, uh, in participating in the money lover's nature and not be pure in his attachment to virtue, having been abandoned by the best guardian. What's that? Adamantus said, argument mixed with music. It alone, when it is present, dwells within the one possessing it as a savior of virtue throughout life. What you say is fine, he said. Such then, I said, is the Timocratic youth like the Timocratic city. Now remember, these youths, right, are very important. They're the young guys that are going to rise up to rule and how they are shaped, right? Um, and what the structures of the society uh, point them towards is kind of the crucial question of how, what, what's the next generation of your, of your polity going to look like? And so one of the great things about this uh, account of the regime is it puts, it gives you personally a little bit more agency. We say, what can we do? Like, I don't have any political power. How can I? Well, you know, I'm starting with the man in the mirror, right? Like, ask yourself, what is my highest good? And, and that uh, slip, which Plato just described, is the one that I made earlier when I said, you know, the um, that that the man who loves music, right, is really good. Well, first wants to be really good at playing the piano, and then he falls in love with the fame, and then he falls in love with the money, right? That's the next the next thing, because of course, money is the sort of outward show of fame. Plato says it's sort of how you do, uh, you know, it, how you satisfy all your appetites, and so it's, it's these successive degrees away from the good. Like, why am I doing each thing? It's because I want to be seen to be good, to get a good post about it on social media, right? Um, do I want a virtue signal about this? Uh, and what does my action in private do, right? When you, your action when nobody is around, this is an old piece of wisdom, right? Your actions when nobody's around tell you more about yourself uh, than your actions when you're in public. Um, how you treat the like waiter at the or the chauffeur or the uh, valet or whatever that tells you more than how you treat your um, you know your boss. And why? Why is that? Well, it's because in private, without external expectations, you strip away the other goods that you might be aiming for besides the good in itself, right? You strip away honor, strip away money. If you can't get honor or money out of being good to somebody, are you still good to them? Um, and so this is like, you know, you can actually ask yourself these questions. And Plato gives like a lot of concrete advice, including like reading before bedtime, which is something we could like still totally pick up, right? He says like, in order to protect yourself against the, uh, you know, the all of the different desires that are going to come clamoring at you, um, spend time beforehand engaging in beautiful arguments. Um, put your phone away. You wouldn't have said this, but I will say it to you, right? Put your phone away. Spend half an hour before bed, half an hour after bed, uh, reading something beautiful, something ennobling, something that's not trash, right? Um, see what happens. Just see what happens. If you just do that, right? Um, this is like when I say, you know, just give prayer a shot, right? Just, just give it a trial run. Maybe you don't know if you believe in God, but give it a trial run. Uh, see what happens. Uh, and this is because, right, what you are actually doing, people think it's magic, people think it's some sort of mumbo jumbo, but what you're actually doing is you're creating, uh, you're furnishing your mind with protections against all the other things that are going to pull the different parts of your soul in different directions. Um, and so this is why eventually after democracy, right, after the love of honors, you get the love of wealth. And, you know, you might say that social media has kind of made Timocrats of us all, right? Um, and that the next step after democracy is the commercialization of everything, which is also a big part going online, right? Not only wanting everybody to praise you, but then wanting to sell yourself, right? And pieces of yourself and pieces of your private life for uh, others, right? To get money out of it. So if you can't get honor, then you can at least get cash, right? Um, and that's the de exact kind of soul decay that Plato was talking about, which leads to regime decay. So it's like, you want to clean up America, you want to clean up our regime, like you ought to clean up these forces in yourself. Doesn't doesn't mean you can't ever be online and Lord knows that I do too much tweeting, right? It doesn't mean that you can't uh, slip and fall from time to time, but it does mean that this is the kind of project that you're engaging in, is finding what you actually, what your logos knows to be good and really genuinely installing that as the highest good in public and in private, in your personal life and in your work, right? In everything you do and in every context, right? Um, having that correct arrangement. So that's what players talking about. He's talking about the breakdown of that oligarchy comes next, right? Um, so let's read a little bit about the oligarchic man. This is true love of, of wealth, right? 
Um, now we're really at the sort of point of two cities. Uh, and remember that Plato is saying, you know, there's going to be honors distributed in this in this regime, but they're not going to be the best honors, and it's not going to be the best way of going about things because they've they've set their sights too low, right? Rather than on the good, they've set their sights on the honors that come from the good. Because when his when the son uh, is born of a when the son of a timocratic man is born, uh, he at first emulates his father and follows in his footsteps, and then sees him blunder against the city as against a reef and waste his property as well as himself. He's saying when you see goodness uh, or even the love of honor, right? Uh, rewarded with agony and with dishonor. Um, you know, he had either been a general and had held some other great ruling office and then got entangled with the court, suffering at the hands of sycophants and underwent death, exile, or dishonor and lost his whole substance. And the son, seeing and suffering this and having lost his substance, is frightened, I suppose, and thrusts love of honor and spiritedness headlong out of the throne of his soul. He's saying, if this is what it's going to get me, right, if you watch people try to serve, I mean, many of us have had this experience, right? I know that, you know, like somebody like Julian Assange has been really big for people because they think they see this guy like trying to warn people of important stuff and only getting assaulted and attacked for it, right? Or, you know, pick your guy that you saw, you know, suffer at the hands of the state for doing what was good. You talk about Loudoun County, right? That, that father that was trying to protect his daughter getting just like, physically ripped out of the uh, community, right? Um, and, and subject to all sorts of persecutions. It's like, well, if that's what it gets me to try to be good or to try to get honor, um, then screw that, man. Like, I don't want any of that. And instead, right, what I'm going to amass is, is power, power to do what I want. Um, and power is kind of money is sort of the like um, instrument of power. It's just this all purpose symbol signifier for doing what you want. So this is Plato goes on to, to say this. He says, uh, or rather, I should say, Socrates, right, says, do you know to what you must look if you want to see the wrongdoings of these men, to their guardianship of orphans and any occasion of the kind that comes their way and gives them a considerable license to do injustice? This almost takes us back to the ring of Gyges, remember, when what do you do when you're invisible, right? Isn't it plain from this that when such a man has a good reputation in other contractual relations, because he seems to be just, he is forcibly holding down bad desires, which are there with some decent part of himself. He holds them down not by persuading them that they had better not, nor by taming them with argument, but by necessity and fear, doing so because he trembles for his whole substance. Very much so, he says. And by Zeus, my friend, I said, you'll find the desires that are akin to the drone, present in most of them, and they have to spend what belongs to others. Now, the drone right, is sort of the like um, metaphor or the image that Plato uh, gives to Socrates to use throughout um, to describe things that you do um, for reasons that are external to your actual vision of the good. So it might be that you want money, right? And so therefore you will prostitute yourself in all sorts of ways, uh, literal and figurative. It might be that you want, you know, honor. And so you're going to pretend to be a good guy, right? I mean, this description of the oligarchic man is a perfect image of our woke CEOs, right? The guys that, you know, maybe they do, maybe they don't desire to actually like, you know, refigure, configure our state and like, you know, make trans people the center of everything or whatever. Um, but in, in point of fact, right, uh, they're doing those things, right? They're adopting these these virtue signals um, because they want to save face in the eyes of their oligarchic friends, right? And and so the desire of the drone is like, it doesn't matter whether you actually want it or not anymore because you've given your soul, your whole soul over to something, right? The Christian way of describing this is an idol, right? An idol is the thing that your soul has sort of like replaced God with. The highest good is wealth. The highest good is honor. Um, and so the regime starts to take on the shape, right? Our woke CEOs have this kind of, um, you know, we'd say you go woke, go broke, right? So why are these guys doing all of this, you know, woke virtue signaling? Because, you know, when, when it's not making them any money, well, it's because they live and operate in a society that is kind of teaching them uh, that in order to keep their, you know, it's kind of like security. They're paying security against being disenfranchised by the state by signaling their fealty to this sort of regime, which they think is going to be ascendant, right? Um, so they'll do the trans day of visibility and they'll do the, like, you know, the slashing of, of uh, environmental, you know, the crazy environmental caps on all their production. And they'll do the, like, month-long pride parade, not because they are, like, true believers, but because they are uh, oligarchic in soul, right? They're, they're oligarchs. This is why, you know, we talk about the decay of a republic into an oligarchy. Um, and it's why we're flirting with such dangerous 
dangerous uh, forces. Because the next thing, of course, that happens um, when you start to get this, this system that's based on fear, that's based on retaining power, like Machiavelli says, right, um, and, and therefore is hostile toward and punishes those um, that, that don't have power, not just for existing, just for being a kind of a standing rebuke to the oligarchs, right? Um, when you get into that, you are flirting with the possibility of a, of a people's uprising, right? And that's how uh, democracy comes into being. And Plato has a very, very low view of democracy, pure democracy, in part, of course, because he watched it kill Socrates. He watched him vote the death of Socrates into existence, um, but also because of just the, his sort of whole take on it is that it, it, it is, um, it's like a many colored garment. It's just like the people um, are basically the, the appetitive part of the soul. They, they point in all these different directions at all these different times. Um, and it, it leads up to the establishment of, of tyranny because you're basically just taking, you know, you, once you've uh, opened the floodgates, um, you have just all these different kinds of life that are now available to you in a democracy. You can, you know, you can be a part of an aristocratic society. You can be a part of a, um, a, a you know, a, a, a shop and trade and none of it's better than anything else, right? The total flattening out of all values. Um, and so this lays the groundwork for, for tyranny. And we're going to talk about tyranny next week because that kind of takes us over the bridge um, into book nine, which, as I said, is paired with this book. Um, but this is another one where, you know, that we could spend like 10 episodes just on this book, in part because it is such a complete and contained uh, encapsulation of how philosophy and psychology influence and describe politics. Not politics in the day-to-day, -day, like bang your fist on this or that issue, uh, but the deeper currents underneath that issue, right? Why is it that we are structured as a society in the way we are? Well, it's because when souls decay, right, into democratic and oligarchic forms, you eventually create the possibility for um, not only oligarchic persecution, but also mob uprising and mob rule. Um, that's it for now. If you want more on this stuff, a lot of this is in the book uh, of How to Save the West. You can pre-order it now on Amazon. This idea of looking underneath the skin of our daily political struggles to find the forces that, you know, the ancient philosophers have identified, that's, that's all in the book. So go check out How to Save the West. For now, let's take a mailbag question. It's time once again to talk about Gold River Trading Company. I love to drink their tea all day. Um, <laughs> these guys are actually really, really great. I just want them to hire me to do their jingles, though. Um, this this tea is so good, you guys. It, it was really hard for me, actually, after I came back over from uh, the UK to find good tea. There's not a lot of great tea brands in the States, but Gold River is the primo tea brand. I love their American breakfast black tea in particular, but they've got a bunch of different varieties, green tea, chamomile, if you don't like caffeine. It's very flavorful. It comes in these little pyramid sachets that makes it really easy to, uh, you know, put, in, put into your water and mix it up however you like. Um, you can get all sorts of uh, excellent varieties if you go to goldriverco.com. That's goldriverco.com, and you will get 10% off if you use the offer code Heretics, H-E-R-E-T-I-C-S. So it's goldriverco.com. Use the offer code heretics and you can get all of their different varieties of tea, uh, including the non-caffeinated ones, if that's your thing, for 10% off. Mailbag questions come to me on locals, youngheretics.com forward slash locals is where you can go to become a VIP. Uh, VIPs get extra goodies. They get uh, episodes a week in advance. I write a uh, weekly or uh, sometimes uh, it takes me a couple of weeks to turn, turn one out, but I, I write uh, uh, sort of installments of a translation and commentary on Paul's letter to the Romans, which has been really uh, edifying and fulfilling. We do weekly live streams. You can get your questions answered. Um, but more importantly than that, it's a way for us to take these ideas further. You can see the profound implications, I think, the explosive implications of some of the things that uh, Plato is writing. And uh, of course, that of the other authors that we talk about on this show describe as well. And so, you know, people want to know, well, how do I apply that to this situation in my life or this idea or whatever? Um, and that's what we do on, on locals. I hope you'll join us as a special community. It's youngheretics.com forward slash locals. Uh, okay. Here's a, a mailbag question from locals VIP, Mr. LD Baker. I've been slogging through the complete Plato. And I've come across some verbiage that's reminiscent of some parts of the New Testament. Yeah, the crucifixion, for example, of the true philosopher, you may recall. Um, obviously, the gospel writers probably would have been familiar with the Socrates, Plato, Aristotle corpus by the time they set down their writings. I'm curious, though, if there's any evidence that Jesus was aware of them as well. Um, this is a really fascinating and exciting question, and it's part of a bigger parcel of questions that we've been talking a lot about on Locals lately, actually, which is what kind of contact between, quote, East and West can we think about in the ancient world. And there have been great books written about 
the uh, influence of the East upon the West. So like the East face of Helicon, for instance, is about archaic Greek poetry from like the 800s and 700s BC um, and how it may or may not have taken up elements from like Gilgamesh and um, even the Old Testament, right? That there are these kind of uh, Semitic uh, themes and tropes that perhaps made their way uh, from East to West into Greek work. Um, and there have been arguments that like this was, uh, you know, more influential upon Plato and Socrates than has la has been um, has been assumed. But I, I I think that once you get into the classical period, you really are dealing with uh, original works and and insights that are uh, not really having a lot a whole lot of contact with the Jewish world, if at all. Um, and so Athens and Jerusalem at this point are are really kind of developing on their own separate tracks. It's not until Rome that the two become super commingled, although there are sites where they are commingled um, during the Hellenistic era. Um, but, you know, the, the kind of melding of Ath Athens and Jerusalem doesn't really happen until under the Roman Empire and the real birth of, of Christianity as a force in the world. Um, and so I don't believe that what you're looking at when you read Socrates sounding a lot like Jesus, right? I don't think you're reading like the gospel author's cribbing from Plato or you're reading Plato cribbing from the Old Testament. Um, I think you're, you're reading a basic fundamental granular structure of the world an, an under the skin truth um, about how the world is broken, how it persecutes its prophets, how truth is un disfavored systematically in human society, right? Um, and these patterns that play out and these observations that smart people, insightful people are able to make, right, um, look similar because they are true fundamentally. Um, and once you get down to that structural level, not talking about like this particular historical event or whatever, but what are the dynamics at play, um, you're going to be talking about fundamental truths, which are, I believe, fully encapsulated in the gospel. The gospel is the perfect truth because it basically has the most full and entire depiction of all of this. Um, now, the uh, possibility of Jesus, right? Jesus's knowledge is a famously thorny question because he's God, right? Um, and that means that in some capacity, he is omniscient, right? Uh, God is omniscient. And so the second person of God is also omniscient. But it, 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 it is my belief that in the incarnation, right? He takes upon himself the experience of not being omniscient. Um, and so Jesus, the man in time, right, who is an incarnation of God, right, is expressing the part of God that knows what it's like not to be omniscient. And so I don't think that Jesus would have had mystical knowledge of, of Plato and Aristotle. Um, there is rabbinic contact pretty early on with, with uh, Plato uh, and, and Aristotle and Greek philosophy more generally. Um, there's no indication that I can see that I've ever found very persuasive that he read or spoke Greek um, or or uh, even Latin. You know, that scene in The Passion of the Christ where he talks to Pilate in Latin, that's that's extra biblical, right? Um, and and so, I, you know, my suspicion is that actually, no, my suspicion is that uh, the contact with the pagan uh, Greek world would mostly be from late, from early church sources, right? I mean, Paul really is the great deliverer of, uh, of, of Greek philosophy, the great melder of Greek philosophy with, um, with, with Jewish philosophy or Jewish theology um, in many ways. But yeah, I, I don't think that Jesus would have known about them. I think that he just was the truth. And so everything that is true is contained in his life. Um, thanks for that question. This is a really fun one. I, I love that, these kind of questions about ancient, uh, d ancient kind of cultural crossover. Uh, and we will talk more about it on Locals. Go to youngheretics.com forward slash Locals to join us. Please do rate, review, and share this podcast wherever you get your podcasts. Subscribe if you haven't already. It's great to let more people know about it. Always hearing from new people, and that's thanks to you, right? It's thanks to you telling people about it or giving us five stars because that bumps us up in the algorithm. Um, so please do all of those things. Uh, and also check out the Claremont Institute where I work. Uh, it's claremont.org slash donate to support us in our work uh, furthering the American idea and recovering it. Um, and we would really appreciate that. And I think you would really like the work that we publish there at ClaremontReviewBooks.com and AmericanMind.org. All right, that's it for me this week. I will see you next time for more truth, beauty, and the stuff that you can